here. So, you know, welcome back to Authors and Chains. We are here with the infamous Reese David, audio producer and voice actor extraordinaire. Say hi, Reese. Hello. Oh, listen to that <laughs> sexy voice. Oh, it gets me every time. God, ooh, I get chills. I just get chills. But today we're going to be talking about the Audible stuff. We're going to be trying to kind of, you know, unscrew it up for people. Because I get a lot of questions on Audible. How do you do it? Why do you do it? Um, amazingly enough, a lot of authors don't see a value in it. I have talked to more authors who literally look at it and go, why would I do that? I got my book published. And you go, you know, we were talking a second ago, three billion people listen to Audible. Um, from somebody who has published books that I heavily advertise and Audible, you make much more off the Audible. Even per book, you make more off of it. Much less, you know, selling as a whole. I think it's something like 80% more off your Audible than you do off your written work. Because written work, as much as we like it, not as popular as, and even less popular than it was 20 years ago. People are switching to an easily digestible thing they can do for going to work, sitting around the house, driving in your car. They pick up audiobooks. And everybody I know who's got Audible has like a hundred some odd books in their Audible easily. Um, and, and I'll kind of run through this. About, I don't know, two years ago, a year ago, I decided I was going to do the Audible thing. I was going to invest the time and the uh, money. And ACX, which is Audible's tool for authors and for voice producers to do this, is a very easy thing to use. You go, you register, you find a piece of your book, and you literally set up a script and put it out there. And people will, will look through that, and they will send you auditions. Your job at that point is to find somebody who can read your book. From an author standpoint, and Reese will probably cover this more than I will, um, reading your own stuff is not always easy because you wrote it so you know in your mind what it's supposed to sound like and what it's supposed to do. Having somebody else does it, do it brings a whole new voice and a whole new perspective to those characters that I will promise you will blow you away. Um, and maybe it's just Reese who blows me away, but it's literally will blow you away. The first time I sat down and heard him, heard the, heard the recording of, Revenant with Reese doing it, I literally was jumping up and down like I was a 12 year old and it was Christmas. <laughs> literally, it was just awesome. So, well, he picked it, a fun it, section to do. Oh, yeah, you know, it was a, it was a fun section. I, I absolutely picked that just for that. But 30 people, and I'll give you an example 30 people auditioned for Revenant, and out of that, we chose one. He nailed it, literally nailed it. Everything about the book, the, the the jokes, the timing, the sarcasm, he nailed it. I was absolutely thrilled. But it takes you probably 20 minutes to go register your item on Audible. It does, 20 minutes. Within a week, I guarantee you will at least have three people audition for your book. As long as it's not absolutely horrendous, you will at least have three people, literally. From my perspective, that's what I did. I created the script, I put it up there, I registered, I put all the cool little information, and I sent it out to the web, and Reese got it. Now, now he can cover his end of it from, from a producer standpoint. You know, let's talk about Audible. Yeah, well, I mean, Audible, Audible is a, as a tool for listeners, it's, it's, it's fantastic. The, uh, I've, I've been listening to audiobooks for, for donkey's years, but until the internet until you were really able to stream things at speed getting an audiobook was you either go to a library and borrow it in which case you probably yeah, take a couple CDs. of weeks to get through it or it costs an absolute fortune but i've been listening to them since they since you could only get them on tape since before there were CDs. oh yeah the old cassette ones <laughs> i still have the, my <laughs> doctor who collection i don't want to hear it in fact I, just, oh, I can't reach it from here but just outside that door there is there is an old pack it's it's the size of a small briefcase <laughs> Of lot of like one of those child's lunch boxes just full of cassettes for one book, like twelve hours of audio takes up a lot of space. If you want that in your car stereo, you're gonna be doing a lot of chopping and changing at junctions. It's not safe. So uh, being able to just plug a plug your phone or your iPod or whatever into into your car stereo and, and you've got your journey listening set then. You don't have to worry about a, a rubbish DJ playing the wrong record at the wrong time. You just think, right, I'm enjoying my book, I'll put that on. It's a great way of. Uh, it's also brilliant if you just if you're doing the washing up. I I hate yeah, you know, doing I mean, 
manual tasks that have, do not involve my brain in any way. <laughs> I need something to occupy my brain. So I listen to a book. I feel it's an excellent you know, way of doing it. From my personal experience, anytime I'm doing renovations, anytime I'm doing yard work, anytime I'm driving, exactly if I'm doing something thing, yeah. where I don't need my whole brain, I got an audio book on. Absolutely. I probably have hundreds of them in my phone. Um, because I don't get a chance to read. You know, I don't get a chance to sit down with an actual book. So this gives me the chance to enjoy those things while doing something else. So it's huge. Yeah, it's so much easier. I've read something like probably about 25, 30 books by listening to them since I started the last physical book that I am still only about two chapters into. <laughs> and oh, yeah, got a and whole, whole to be fair, there, it's quite book. a dense yeah. book. It's, it's about math, so it's quite dense. But it's, <clears throat> it's very well written. It's very digestible. But I, I get to certain points and think, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I'm going to have to think about that, put the book down, go to sleep. Don't touch it again for months. And by that time, I've got to go back to the beginning of chapter two and start again. So, yeah, audiobooks are very helpful for that as well. But uh, as a producer, yeah. um, it's only very recently that ACX has had a presence in the UK. Um, yeah. There were several, I wouldn't even go as far as to call them companies. There were several operators out there um, who were claiming to be authorized suppliers for Audible. When the fact is, if you could get in touch with an author, if you could produce a book for them, they could arrange through Amazon to get it put on Audible. There was no such thing as an authorized right. supplier until ACX turned up. So most of them were trying to con people. What they were actually trying to do was trying to sell you a course on how to become an audiobook producer. And I actually went to a meeting with one of these guys, um, and he had a decent setup. He had a, a, a you know a proper studio. He had a bit of a photographic studio attached and such. And, um, but uh, he had me read a bit of audio and uh, asked me what sort of setup I had, what experience I had. And uh, I, could, I could just see him getting more and more bored as he realized there was nothing he could sell me. Like, he couldn't even like sell me equipment that he could put a markup on because I already had my own setup. Oh, yeah. So he was so just downtrodden by the end of this sort of 45 minute meeting he's like right i've just wasted the last hour of my life i can't con this guy <laughs> so i moved on to the next one. The thing is <coughs> I, I i googled him a few a few months later i googled him at the time and there was there was very little about him other than his own website googled him a few months later right. and there was a news article on the bbc's webpage about this guy uh, having done this before having tried to con people into buying training courses before in a different industry and now he was doing this. So when ACX turned up, I, I, I was sort of at the end of my tether. Am I ever going to be able to get a full-length audiobook job? I've been doing voiceovers and sort of uh, corporate training, um, you know, explainer videos, that sort of thing. And uh, I'd tried this before, but I tried it again. I thought, right, Audible's authorized supplier. And up came ACX. They'd literally, in the last couple of weeks, they'd just gone live in the UK and it was, it, it, it was honestly, it was a game changer for me. It is now my full-time career. Um, it, it's great. made that much of a difference That's to me. That's impressive. Um, well, I mean, the, it's, uh, it's, well, you got to have talent to do it. I mean, everybody can access it, but it's kind of like the same thing with authors. Anybody can write a book, but getting it out there and getting people to read it is a whole different thing. Exactly. Yeah, getting in touch with the right people, knowing who those people are in the first place. Um, I imagine, you know, just, just trying to get hold of a... a the right person within a publishing company to get a book published or even read with a view right. to publishing it in the first <clears> place <throat> must have been so much harder before the internet. I imagine it's still pretty hard now, but no, getting... it is. it's well, it's there's a lot of difficulties behind it, but that's the whole point. Mm. I mean, it's, it's, you gotta have a, you gotta really have tenacity to do it. Mm. But, uh, but what I do, because I don't have to create the work, <laughs> I can rely on somebody else putting in, you know, months, years, decades of their life into creating this labor of love, this thing that they've had in their head since they were a teenager, since they were a small boy or girl, maybe. And finally, they've got it down on the page and they want an audio producer. And I just go on the website and, uh, oh, yeah, no, that, that sounds pretty good. Yeah. Oh, wow, I, I love the not way really into romances. Maybe my that. entire work right there. I was uh, just yeah. awesome. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I don't really have to create anything. I I just have to interpret. So my job is a lot easier than it what took you do. A long time to craft those fuck jokes. All right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I will compliment you on your use of fuck. 
Um, that's an inside joke for readers of the uh, of, Shadow of, of Chronicles, by the way. A lot of pressure. <laughs> um, yeah, but it turns out, like you say, it is really, really easy to use. And in a, in a way, it's easier for from my end. It depends how much how much material you you want to or need to put online, how many examples of your wow. previous work, that sort of thing you bother uploading. You don't really have to create much of a profile at all, as long as you're, you know, you've put your basics on there, your basic contact details for the site to be able to get hold of you. Once you've done that, you can just start trawling through auditions straight away. You can start trawling through um, people who've put their books up on the site. There's a little, like you say, just a, a little chunk of the book. Some of them put a bit too much up, but... You know, a little maybe kind sometimes like it's only thirty books. seconds it's worth of audio, really sometimes good. it's you know, forty five minutes sometimes they want. So usually I'll cut that down. <laughs> I'll just I'll pick a ten minute and, chunk of it at and most. And there are yeah, there are people out there who will and this is the one other thing I get from authors, it's like, well, it's just so so expensive to get it done. And it's like, okay, well what have you done? Well, you know, I do military sci fi, so I went out and looked up R. C. Bray and he's five hundred and fifty an hour and you're like, <laughs> of course it's overly you know, you've got a, a fourteen hour, fifteen hour book and five hundred and fifty bucks an hour, yeah, go mortgage your house. You know, I mean yeah. and yeah. that's because he is the guy in military sci-fi you know he's like the guy so yeah well i mean if you want a named do. actor if you want a known right you're character pay to, for to sell your book you will yeah you will have to pay for it you might actually have to go to a theatrical agent to get you know to get the if, if you've right. got bill we Wheaton, want leo dicaprio your reading yeah. your book you're gonna need a few uh, million in the bank I, I, well, probably Stewart, not a few million but still if i was gonna hire but, somebody it would be patrick stewart Oh, well, he's yeah, not for my fabulous yeah, voice. So Stewart would be he, awesome. He actually, because he's Patrick got plenty in the bank Stewart. himself, he actually, if he likes the project, he doesn't actually charge that much. So he's, that's how he's ended up on... He does adverts for, for tea in England because he likes I've the seen, advert. Yeah, it's a funny advert. <laughs> yeah, um, I get don't it. have yeah, to pay him millions. Um, and obviously he's, he's in he, America. He's got dad, that voice, well. man. He could be... I mean, he could be anywhere and he just speaks and everybody goes, Picard? You know, I mean, <laughs> exactly. literally, it's See, just, that's depending on the generation, professor going, where's yeah. right, pretty much. <laughs> but he's just got one of those voices. But what I usually tell yes, all he worked you know, at that, he, he learned to speak like that. He's actually he's from, I think he's he from did. Leeds. Originally. He's a Yorkshireman. So he oh. does. He didn't have the received pronunciation, the classic English accent when when he started. I remember out. He went to school and learned how to do that. Yeah, Excalibur, 1981. He played in that, and that was the first time I heard his distinctive voice was in Excalibur. He had that very Shakespearean, powerful voice during well, that movie. That's what he originally like, was, was a Shakespearean. Yeah, actor. he was a Shakespearean. He's still yeah. Actor. yeah, he was RSC. I, think he did, uh, I don't think he did Hamlet, but I'm pretty sure he did Macbeth in his early years. I'm pretty yeah. sure um, Hamlet. I'm pretty sure. Not it wouldn't surprise me if he had. I just haven't Excalibur. That was the first time I saw Patrick Stewart was in that movie. He played uh, Gu like uh, Guinevere's father or something in that one. It was great. I just showed my age there, by the way, but that was okay. You know. Dude, that was Merlin. He had the cool metal headpiece. That was awesome. That was in the 90s, wasn't it? That was, no, that was like 87 or something. He was on TV yeah. before then i've been watching him since the first star trek next generation episode well this was this was pre-next generation though that's what he was yeah but yeah, yeah but going back to the yeah he this guy's just oh he was awesome but from an from an author standpoint what i usually tell <laughs> authors keep your mind open you know one of the things first first thing i will tell you is don't don't read your own book. If this is your first time doing Audible, don't because there's breathing things you got to worry about and it doesn't sound good and it's your first book and you're nervous and you're not going to read it right. Your timing's going to be off. It really comes down to voices and timing, at least for me when it comes to a book. And one of the hardest things to do when you listen to somebody read your book is enjoy it. And I was fortunate enough to have Reese do it because I absolutely, I listened to my whole book and I enjoyed every minute of it, which was something you don't do as an author. Mm -hmm. Because anybody out there who has written a book will do the same thing I do. The second they pick it up, hear it or read it, go, ah, well, I should have rewritten that. That was retarded. Why the hell did I get him to say that? Where the hell did that come from? You know, you spend half your time going, even McDonald's is hiring. I'll just put this in the, you know fireplace and go do something else uh, because that's what you do but i was fortunate enough to literally forget i wrote it you know i'm listening to it i loved it i forgot i wrote it 
It was great. I mean, that was the best sales pitch ever was I literally forgot I wrote the thing. I'm like, that's a funny joke. And I'm like, oh, wait, I wrote that. That was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you know? and that's, yeah, uh, some people yeah. laugh at their own jokes all the time. But if you're not that kind of person, yeah, no. being able to laugh at a joke you wrote is, is quite a big thing. <laughs> I only do but that when I'm stoned. <laughs> but, but I always tell people when they're doing audio for the first time, put it out there, keep your mind open, listen to the book. One of the nice things about going and having somebody else do your book, as I was saying before, it brings a new vision to your story. In your head, you have your own movie. You know how it plays out. You can give advice, but you're taking your work and handing it to somebody else, and they're forming their own movie. It may be different than yours, and it may even be better than yours because of their ability to do that. And that's one of the things I learned is that different vision adds such a new spark to the material you've already put out. Mm. I really well, just don't. to just to, to add to what you're saying there, if you're if you're reading your own material, like you say, you're you know how you meant it to sound, but nobody else alive is going to interpret it the same way you intended it to be interpreted. Not exactly, anyway, no matter how good you are. Of course. So you in a way it it's almost necessary to get that third person perspective on it because any third person is going to have a better idea of how everybody else is going to hear your words than you are because you spent so long crafting it you've heard it so many and times you've is, read it over and over exactly again you changed the sentence so many times you know exactly how you thought it should sound but in everybody else's heads it's going to sound a little different so if you can get somewhere near the average of what everybody else is expecting from the sentence you, you're and probably not going to yeah. be uh, if if you just read it the way you intended it it might not chime with as many people as it otherwise might. And, and that is true because you may listen to something that you yourself go, I don't know, maybe, but in your own mind, you have how that book should sound or how you think it should sound. So he's right. So recent, you're absolutely right. Bring a third person into it or more than one third person into it. Let you get a consensus because they do not know how you think of the book. They do not know how the, the audio producer thinks of the book. The writer thinks of the book. What they do is are they're listening to it from fresh perspective. What do you think about this voice, these characters, this dialogue? And they come at it brand new. And you get a very you get a fresh perspective of how they think that's going to sound. And that's the first thing you get when you're doing that is how your audience is going to take to that book. Mm. That is the prime litmus test. Right. The there. flip side of that from the from the producer's standpoint is to a certain extent, when you're reading those audition pieces you have to try and get a sense of what the author's hoping for as well. You can't just That's give it your own interpretation. Yeah. You have to, you have to, you don't just read the audition piece. You read the description of what the book is, any notes that they've added, because you can give us as an author, you can put as much guidance as you want on there. You can put reams of notes on there. If you want, chances are people will skip over it if you put too much, but you can give specific guidance. Like for example, <laughs> you wanted specific, uh, you wanted, your character is from a specific place in the United States, so a, a generic right. U.S. accent, or uh, you know, a New York people, accent isn't going to work for a guy from, it, from North Carolina. Yeah, right. One guy nailed it. He's across the pond. It was the most. It was the funniest thing. I even had a guy from North Carolina try it, and he screwed up the accent. Wait, 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 wait! wait. I want to hear it. I want to hear the accent. I I don't know. He's got to do the accent. Well, yeah, buy the one. book. <laughs> There you go. I'm telling you, he does it good. Read the book. Yeah, he does it. He he, he does oh, an excellent job. But 30 people, only one guy nailed the accent. I thought it was funny, but it's true. I mean, you're absolutely right. And well, auditions. Do you know what? I'll let you in on a little secret. Um, the way that I modeled Blake ac Blake's accent was obviously he's a kind of uh, he's an ex army. He's a kind of rough and tumble guy. Oh yeah, but the bravado. In terms of the man. regional part of it. Uh, House of Cards. Where's yep, the lead character know, from? I know exactly. Yep, I know. Exactly. South Carolina. Exactly so I thought ah, South Carolina, de southern it a little bit, masculify it just a little bit, but try and stay relatively close to Spacey's performance in that. And the the way that the Carolinas pronounce their R's is very very different from you just go a little bit further south or a little bit further west, and it it rolls the R so much further. It's but. I've had to go back and re-record several sections in the, in the one that uh, that you're reviewing now, um, in Vengeance. Yep. I've had to go back and re-record a couple of chapters in that because I realised actually I'd, I'd I'd migrated out towards sort of I, I was I was 
closer to Tennessee than I was the Carolina Carolinas. That's and funny. It's, yeah. Yeah. So and that's gotta uh, yeah, be hard. I, I mean, there's always all the after... voices. Oh my god! Did you learn all well, this? Yeah, it's got to be difficult. School? Or Sorry, did you, just learn, did you learn this in acting school, or did you just like? Uh, I have never theater? been to acting school. Really? You took a shady course been... online. No, I'm just kidding. No, I I have never <laughs> taken any acting course. I did. Uh, I started taking a theater studies course, which included a bit of. Uh, uh, it was meant to include a bit of acting training. I didn't get that far through the course, mm -hmm. though. So it wasn't what I was expecting. It was much more about uh, how you break down a script and how you block out a scene and how the lighting works. And it, it was very much the whole theatre experience you're studying, not just the acting side of it. So yeah. it wasn't what I was looking for. Um, but no, I mean, when I was about probably four or five, I think I was first thrown out onto a stage. Um, with my mother was uh, was in a, a local amateur dramatic society, and me and my brother were dragged along, and and we both really liked it. Um, he's actually uh, does a bit of voiceover work as well. He's actually much better with the accents than I am, although he he complains That's that funny. his his problem is he tends to fall into Simpsons impersonations. <laughs> Um, if, if he doesn't have a more specific character. Well, if you're going to be doing U.S. books, Simpsons a good way to go, at least for a certain genre. Yeah. Uh, uh, his show reel is absolutely hilarious. Um, but uh, yeah, he doesn't do as much of it. He has he has other strings to his bow. Um, but uh, yeah, I've forgotten where I got it. Oh yeah, uh, so we started off with amateur dramatics. Um, did a bit of dance, a bit of this, a bit of that. Um, musician as well. I worked in local radio. Um, and, uh, I got to a certain point where I was working for an insurance company and they sent us, uh, they sent around a, a piece of training material, um, with a voiceover done by someone in the training department who had terrible equipment to do it on, had a very monotone voice and a lisp and a very thick regional accent. And he knew that he was doing it really, really badly, but there was no one else to do it for him. So I just, I just said, look, do you want me to redo this? He said, yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. No, no, I'm not insulted. Don't worry. If you can do it, <laughs> anybody else can do it. If anybody else had volunteered, I'd let them do it. Go for it. So I took, <laughs> took the materials home and so re-recorded it, and they sent that around the company. Um, and then a couple of other departments wanted me to do theirs, and I got a bit of overtime out of it. Um, and then the the parent company for that insurer, the global parent company, said, oh, well, can you do our, our risk training? And uh, so I did a few pieces of that. And I thought, well, hang on. I, I used to be on radio all the time. I didn't get paid for it. I was a volunteer at the time. Um, <laughs> but I, I actually have quite That's a lot okay. of experience radio. with yep. this sort of thing. And so why don't I just try and get paid doing this? So I just started Googling, hey, you know, it's... voiceover agencies, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, and eventually a... that led to ACX tough... and to... Yeah, ACX is a tough job because you're wearing more than one hat as a as a producer. I mean, you've got the nice mic there. You've got a you got a filter buff. You probably got some Presonus equipment. You probably got like Pro Tools or GarageBand or something, you know, to mix it down. But you're not only a voice actor; you're also the producer. You have to go back, mix it down, do the cuts, listen to it, make sure it meshes okay, make sure there's no background noise. There's a lot of work when dealing with audio files. A lot of work. There is. I mean, so uh, the yeah. the amount of experience and the the how used I am to the software, um, it's a lot quicker for me You're than right. it would be for somebody who's never done it before. Certainly, but it isn't actually as as technically difficult as you might think. Um, there's more, you don't have to spend a fortune on software. Yeah. You don't have to spend a fortune on equipment. That most home PCs now have onboard sound that will do anything you need it to. Uh, yep. you, if you were producing music, it would be a different matter because you're playing a lot of different sounds at the same time. But most PCs will do what I'm doing when I produce an audio book. There's free and software maybe it's out just, there. Yeah. And maybe, there's, maybe I was using the wrong software. I was using Audible. When I had done the, the one test, yeah. When I had done one test, I wanted to hear how I sound reading it. Um, the, the limiters, the, the, the DSers, you know, putting all this stuff in, setting it up and then hearing the breathing, because that was the hardest thing when you read something <laughs> and, you, and Blake walked into the uh, room, you know, you're like, oh, yeah, it's right. disconcerting <laughs> when you first feel like this is something yeah. I had oh. to do. Uh, I used to run training, training courses at, um, when I worked for the radio, uh, one of the things that people do a lot when they're speaking off the cuff, obviously, is say, um, quite a lot. And yes. you have to 
you, yes. you, you train people <clears throat> not to say, um, the other thing is when they're listening back to their own voice, they hear themselves breathing and oh, they think it's breathing. really, really loud, but it's not. It's not necessarily really, really loud. It's just that you don't notice the sound of your own breath. So when you hear it played back, you think, oh, my God, that sounds terrible. No, that's what everyone else always hears. <laughs> well, <laughs> no, see, maybe it sounds terrible, but probably it just that. sounds completely normal. Yeah. Um, and actually, well, I did I watch speak. a couple of uh, I did watch a couple of online uh, uh, sort of um, how to's um, that ACX produced and a couple of just on YouTube when right. I first started trying to do full length books. Um, if you're doing like a, uh, an explainer video or an advert or something, you do want to get rid of all of the breath sounds. If you're reading a book, the breath is part of the timing. It's part of how you mark how a sentence works, how a paragraph is going, how a character is feeling. So you actually right. don't want to get rid of your breath unless it's like a really scrappy breath or there's a strange sound in your throat. You want to leave most of that in. Uh, if it's a, if it's a work of fiction, nonfiction, it's kind of up to you. You listen back and think, does that sound professional? But when you're doing fiction, when you're reading characters, when you're reading narrative, breath is a very important part of what people hear when you're talking to them. So why would right. you get rid of that when you're producing audiobooks? So there's a lot less work than you might think. <clears throat> Most of that can just stay in. Really, it's just mistakes. And that was, you know. And that was probably me going back and listening to a couple of my ad, pe ad pieces that I had done and been like, what point did I get hungry enough to eat the mic? You know, because that <laughs> literally what it sounds like I'm doing is yep, chewing the mic. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was it was I had actually a note on the bottom of my PC when I was recording a couple of things which said, you moron, breathe out your nose. Literally, that's what the note said. It's right there in front of the microphone because uh, it was just it was horrible. But I mean, yeah, there's, but there's a lot of things. You, yeah. Now you it use, depends what, what you kind of work you're doing, but yeah, you you I mean, things like that. Just leaving yourself a little note to remind you of something that's not obvious. Sometimes reminding yourself of something that is obvious. But you, you, when you're sitting down with headphones on in a silent room with a microphone in front of you, and your voice is really loud in your head, and there's nothing else going on. What might seem really obvious when you're thinking about it, having a cup of tea in the living room, when you come and sit down and record it, it goes completely out of your head. So stuff like that's right. really helpful. Just writing down little notes, like you know, some people, you know, write down what would so and so do to help them think about things. Other people, well, it's, you know, it's, don't forget to do the washing up. It's the same with any <laughs> task. If you if you think you're gonna forget something, <clears throat> write it down. There's nothing wrong with that. Well, it's. You know, and, and this is the the funny thing. As we progress further in with, with different books and characters, is one of the things I always wonder is how do you keep track? Now, it's got to be great when you have like a book with preset three characters to entire series. That's an easy, it's awesome. But when you got somebody like me and you're sitting there and you're throwing characters in left and right, you got to be sitting there going, "Fuck, really? Did three paragraphs with this guy and he's gone? I come up with a voice for this? You bastard!" You know, <laughs> I mean, you yeah, got but, like I mean, six you're... main characters and like a bunch of people coming in off the side. Well, the way your your cast is constructed is actually it's quite helpful for that because there is a core cast uh, yeah, that's yeah. the crew, the, the the senior crew of of the ship is they're the ones that are always going to be in most scenes and they're sort of major adversaries. You know right. you're going to have to come up with a distinctive voice for them. For everybody else, you can be relatively generic, but yes, you do have to keep track of if it's just like within one scene and you refer to a right. communications officer several times, then you do have to remember what voice you used for the communications officer. But in a different scene, if you refer to the communications officer and they don't have a name, could be a different officer. Doesn't <laughs> matter so much. And the thing is, the listener will have completely forgotten that voice because it was a generic one. But the core cast, if it's really obvious from the way the book is constructed who the core cast are, then that makes it a hell of a lot easier. Um, otherwise, uh, yeah, you do have well, to keep yeah. backtracking or make a lot of notes so on who's who. The book I'm producing at the moment, I've got literally I've got two A4 sheets covered in character notes oh. because the author oh. very kindly let me know in advance, these are the characters that are going to keep coming up. These are the ones that are going to be in the oh. next couple of books. Well, at least he wasn't a jerk. That's good. Because <laughs> I didn't well, hit, yours, there was no notes when I sent it. I'm like, here's a book. Have fun. See ya. 
Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. You you didn't need to because they're the crew of the ship, so it's obvious. With his, it's a whole spread out world, and you, you it chops and changes from on different continents. You don't know who's going to be coming back and who's going to be killed in the next scene. So it was really helpful to have those notes. It's not always necessary though. Um, no, like a non-fiction book, for example, no characters at all. Brilliant. Somebody's <laughs> telling their life story. They, even if they're quoting their best friend, if, they, if they're like recounting a conversation, you don't necessarily have to come up with a character voice because it's this person's life story. It's them who's telling you this. So with a lot of work that's on ACX, you don't have to worry about that. But yeah, if you're going to get into a big work of fiction with lots of different characters, you do have to keep track. It's, it's, it's not as difficult as you might think once you get going, but it, it's predicting who's going to come back and who's not. That so can be tricky. If I'm writing like an epic fantasy and it's got a couple uh, dozen or so main characters and there are a lot of sub characters that may or may not reappear, I would need to take notes on any that are going to be reappearing. Um, it, it would help. It helps a producer if, if you make those kind of notes. You can go over the top with it. You can frighten people off. But if it's say, if in your mind there's half a dozen characters that are more important than anybody else, then yeah. it might be worth just including characters like this person's um, really proud and haughty and this person's a little bit shifty and weaselly uh, and this person, I haven't really got a voice in mind for them, but in my mind they kind of look like uh, Katniss Everdeen from, uh, from Hunger Games. So maybe you can work with that. It, it could yep, be something you know, like giving great. an existing actor's voice, like they sound a, might sound a bit like this, or it could be character notes like personality traits, but just some kind of guide to to who you're going to have to pay special attention for is is helpful. Yeah, especially if I mean you used the word epic. If it's a big work and there's going to be a lot of characters, oh, oh it's a just, big work. Just give there's them a not helping. A hand. lot, a lot that uh, characters that have to be focused on, mm. but there are several <clears throat> main characters and a few characters <clears throat> that reappear here and there. Well, remember, you don't necessarily have to do it for the audition. You could give a couple of notes for the, just for the characters that are in the audition or just leave it to the producer to, to come up with it. Once you've chosen somebody, once you think somebody's got a good handle on what kind of writer you are, what kind of uh, atmosphere you want um, to, be, to be put across, if you pick someone you like, you can give them as much assistance as you want through the process. You can keep communicating with them all the way through it. Or you can yep. just give them a couple of notes and say, right, go. It's entirely up to you how you want to handle that. But and, and that was, whatever you yeah, do, you don't have to worry about it in the audition necessarily. As long as you give them enough right. information to give you what you're looking for, to give you a good example of what they're capable of. So how many words approximately do you like to start off with for the interview part? Um, the I would say... Preset, yeah, they usually do preset for the script, don't they? If I remember correctly, um, I, I'm not sure how your side of the site works. To be honest, I've never seen the author's yeah. side of it. Um, some people will will put it on on the web page. There'll be a, a chunk of script, and I think that is limited to to a few hundred words, yes. maybe a thousand. Um, others like, will yeah, like a thousand upload words. a sample script, and they'll <laughs> give you, sometimes they'll give you the entire book and say, "Can you just give me something from chapter three? Um, right. So. There, there are there are ways of there are different ways of doing it, but I, I would keep it limited to something that shows, say, two or three characters that you think are really important, maybe more, but the ones that you think are most important to get right. Something that shows off how you write is also surprisingly important um, because I mean I didn't when I first started I was just trying to get a job, but now what I do is I will actually you're trying to it's look more for about someone who can selling write, that yeah yeah I will look for someone who can write good prose. The reason is the harder it is to read, the harder it is to understand, the longer it takes to produce an hour's worth of audio, and that's what yes. you're paid for. You're not paid by the hour of work you do. You're paid by how long the finished piece is. So the longer it takes you to be able to get through a paragraph without having to make loads of mistakes and go and backtrack and, oh, I thought that sentence was going somewhere different or there's too many subordinate clauses in it. If you've got a piece of, uh, a, piece of a chapter that you think shows off how you write, you're more likely to attract someone who is well-suited to your work. And that's more important, I think, 
than attracting somebody who's really good at accents or or has a big deep gravelly voice. You you want someone who's good at reading the way you write. Well, in this, does that make sense? There's, there's, there's that different is, writers, yeah, there's timing. There's different different, well, different uh, voice people for different genres and so on. Well, you, yeah, you I mean, could, it's, yeah, a, it's, it's a matter of personal way. taste to a certain extent, but yeah, I, I would say it's the the thing you want from from your producer, from, well, from your performer, is that they understand the atmosphere that you're trying to provoke, the the emotion that you're trying to to get the reader to feel with a scene. So if their if their voices all sound kind of the same and and it, it's a little bit flat, that's it might not necessarily be a deal breaker if they really get what you're trying to get across. If they really understand and, and, yeah. the, the feelings yeah, the, you're trying to provoke. The well, scenes well, as an author, be modified yeah. as necessary, but the right. the overall tone you're saying is what's most important. I'm sorry? I said you can redo scenes as necessary, but it's the overall tone of the performer that's the important part exactly yeah yeah so if i mean if you're not happy with a particular aspect of their performance but you think they're going to be they're going to be right for your piece but there's something you didn't like about that particular audition piece you can get them to have another run at it you can get half a dozen different people you can literally you can do callbacks you can say right i liked what you did but here's another section. Can you just, uh, I've narrowed it down to like half a dozen people. Can you just, can you do this bit as well? And just give me another example of, of what you're capable of. You don't have to just pick someone and go with it. If you don't get anyone you like, you can just right. leave it up there as long as you want until you get what you're happy with. Yeah, you don't, you're not forced yeah. to choose. Um, but from, a, from an author standpoint, going out to this, when you're submitting a script, it's kind of a twofold. It's kind of a threefold, actually. You want to hear the voices. You want to hear how the how the book plays out. From their end, it's almost like a sales tool. What am I reading? Is, am I going to enjoy it? Am I going to hate it? Is this boring? Is this fun? You know, what is it about this that attracts me to this book? Um, what I can tell you, what authors can do is, and this is my little author tips: go out and talk to your beta readers, talk to people who have read the book. What's your favorite part? What do you like? What do you mm. think these characters sound like? Because you're going to get a lot of that feedback that you can then pass to somebody who's doing this. Because you may have an idea in your head, but when you talk to five other people, all of a sudden that idea expands. Or you may he may tell you something you didn't even think of. Well, it sounds like this guy, and you go, "Well, crap, you're right, it does." You know, so this is a great way to do it. You, you're not in a vacuum. You have a lot of resources to turn to. People who've read your book, your beta readers, your editors, whatever to be able to, to formulate this. And if if somebody's close, but they haven't quite got it, don't be don't be shy, reach out, say, you're, you're so close, but here's what I'm thinking. You know, exactly. it's a collaborative yeah. effort. You wrote it, they're speaking it. You can do that, that's the whole point to it. The better yeah, the, you the work last together, the better three, that book's gonna be. The, the last three books um, that I've been engaged to do, not including your own, they've uh, all yeah, asked me to ones. do that. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, good. The last, yeah, me, the last three other go, authors that it, I've done. That's right. Uh, they've all he asked me to, to me. take hey, another, hey. either take another run at that piece, or they've given me another section to see how I would do with that. It's actually quite a common thing. It seems first few jobs, I was I was going for you know, who's who's going to be most desperate, <laughs> who's going to be and, most and desperate for somebody who's got the skills. Once I had a few under my true. belt, I'm a yeah. bit more confident now, and I, I will actually sift through people's audition pieces to find something like you say, to find something I think I'm going to enjoy reading. Um, yeah. And something but, yeah, you most, can do justice yeah. to. Most of my clients now will ask me to have, if not another run at the same piece, then at least to, to have a go at a different part of the same book. Yeah, and that makes sense. I mean, they want to see how that pacing is going to go. But I mean, from a an, an author standpoint, I mean, from the, from my standpoint, it's you you want to get somebody good. You want to attract somebody who's good. You want to attract somebody who's going to like your book. So pick a part that is the essence of your book. If your book is action and funny and you know, sarcastic, pick that part. If your book is serious and mysterious and there's a lot of murder, then pick that part. Pick a part that's going to give you the essence of that book so when they read it, they not you not only get an idea of what they sound like and how they read it, but they get an idea of what your book's going to be and whether exactly. they're going to like it. Exactly. If, Which somebody is likes you, if somebody likes your book, they're going to do a better job than if they don't. But the, the part that you picked for Revenant, I think we actually used that as yep. a retail sample. Um, so did, if you actually, want to go on Audible and search up 
search up Revenant, Shadow War Chronicles, book one, listen to the retail mm-hmm. sample. That's the piece that Raymond picked for the audition because it shows yep. several of the main characters. It shows a, a little bit of conversation, a little bit of action, um, some prose, some speech. It, it's a good mix of stuff, but it's also quite an exciting scene. And he left me wanting to know what happened next. <laughs> oh, see, that's how he you get the hook. I, I like had an idea. I think school. I know what he's going to do. I know what he's going to do. <laughs> and then, uh, well, now I have to, now I have to audition for this because I want to know what I have to... <laughs> <laughs> That's good though. It was a good, it was a good setup. Yeah, no, it's, it's, it's something you don't have to be shy. And it's really easy to do. And you know what, by, by going out there and putting yourself out, your ability to expand your book into a whole new reader base is right there at your fingertips. The, the whole time you're not doing it, you're, you're losing readers, literally. And, yeah, and it it's, really it's, it's, there is no reason to overlook it, even the money aspect, because yeah, if you want to, you can audition purely on the basis of they get a share of the royalty. It's not a huge share, but it's enough to incentivize them. If the book sells well... I'll make a bit of cash off it, but you don't have to stump up any money until your book is actually selling. So by then, you know it was worth doing. So if you haven't got a budget for it, you can still do it. You can still try this. And like you say, it only takes 20 minutes of your time to set it up. Maybe over the course of several weeks, it'll take a couple of hours. Over the course of several weeks, that's nothing. It's it's almost effortless. So what's the average percentage? Go ahead. What's the average percentage that you charge on royalties if somebody's doing the royalties or whoever charges on royalties? You can do a 50-50. Yeah, you can do a 50-50 or you can do a 25 set you know, with some cash. There's there's a couple of different options now. There used to not be. but Yeah, now it used to be all standardized. Now there, there's a few different exactly. options on it. Yeah. Um, I haven't. I haven't done a, a royalty share for a while, um, just because, uh, well, because I'm doing it as my full time job. Pay I, need, I, need, I need cash. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, I don't tend to do that end of the of the market anymore. But um, uh, most of the more experienced producers will tell you it's better to have a mix of jobs that you've done for for payment on you know payment on the day and royalty jobs that will keep giving you a little bit of cash over a longer period of time. It's good to build that up. Right now, I'm in a position where I need the money now um, because I've only just started doing this full time. So like you say, I've got rent to pay. But once I get ahead of the bills, I've got a little bit of money in the bank. I'll do a few more jobs that are royalty share or part payment, part royalty share, just so that long term, if, for example, my computer blows up and I can't do any work for a couple of weeks, I'll still have at least some money coming in so that I can buy a new computer, for example. Um, So, yeah, there's a lot of different ways you can do it. And a budget is not necessarily a deal breaker. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And and you're absolutely right. You can actually put your book out there and test the waters with that. I mean, this is and the the one thing one thing I get from authors that kind of irritates me. I don't know if this is from the Web or if somebody's giving them advice. You don't have to go to a company, which then goes to Audible. You don't. You don't have to go to a no. production company. You don't have to go to a recording company. You don't have to do any of that. You can literally go to acx.com, sign up, and it walks you through it in five ten minutes, literally. Yeah. Some no bright company, spark no at Audible. People, nothing. Some bright spark at Audible realized that there are lots of authors out there who want to get their stuff on, and lots yeah. of producers out there who want to do the work. But they can't get they can't find each other. So rather than do what most uh, sort of voiceover agencies do, which is either you pay an annual fee or they charge a commission on the work right. or something, they literally just set up an introductory service. It's it's Match.com for authors and producers. It it's, is it's literally only it is. you don't pay for it. Kind of like freelancers and there's freelancer. marginally less. Exactly. Like that. But it's it's as That's I talked to. to an author. Uh, I'll talk to. I talked to a, a friend. A friend of mine who's an author of a very popular book. I won't mention the name because you know I won't. I don't want his agent coming after me. But we sat down and talked about his audible experience versus my audible experience. Now he got somebody very big to do his book, but he's like, you know, I paid the company thirty percent of the, the work and they just did everything. I'm like, really? Because I get a hundred percent. It took me fifteen minutes. 
So literally, <laughs> you know, and he's like, really? You know, so that was a fun conversation, actually. <laughs> yeah, that really was. I was like, the thing is, I, wow, you got screwed. It's, yeah. there's, a, there's probably, I would think, in the mind of most authors, there would be a bit of a, a bit of a myth, an automatic myth almost, that it's a selling point if you have a famous actor. It, yeah, it can no, be. I mean, for example, it can get yeah, you featured yeah, on Audible's front yeah. page, maybe, if you've got you know Stephen Fry reading your book rather than me. It's more, you're more likely to be a to be a featured book. But it's not that much of a selling point. What the, what the selling point is the retail sample that you put on there. So as long as your performer's good, exactly. as long as you're happy with them, it doesn't really it, it doesn't pay to pay tens of thousands of pounds to a, a an outside production house to hire a big name actor to produce something that's going to be of basically exactly the same quality of something you potentially could have got free of charge. And the best way to tell that is ask them. Will you have Audible? Yeah. How did you choose your books? You know, because I don't, I don't go out and choose my books by, by you know, oh, Will Wheaton wrote this. I'm going to have to listen to it. And I actually go out and listen, you know, look at the book, and maybe I might like it, maybe I might not. Because even voice actors will do books that you probably won't like. I mean, yeah. that's, that's the thing. Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, I, I've, uh, I've, done, I've done a couple of doozies. Um, yeah, no, I oh, yeah. there was one a, a few months ago that was... I had a bit of a gap in my schedule and they just, they wanted a rush job and it just sort of, it all matched up. I thought, why not? I, 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 I did a, a nonfiction piece about investing. Um, Oh, that's awesome. That's a real picture. I, I right wasn't there. expecting it to be the most scintillating read. Fair enough. I but I thought it, it might be quite interesting. Um, and as it turned out, it, not only was it not really a book, it was a, a collection of lots of articles Oh. Um, that this this one person had written so and they were all on the same subject and they were all more or less introductory to that subject so there was virtually every chapter repeated itself oh, um, in many oh, ways like the, the oh. same basic phrases used over and over again the whole paragraphs were copied and pasted in some cases not only that i think a lot of these magazines that these articles were published in originally were foreign language publications and it's just been oh, run through awesome. Google Translate and copied and pasted into a chapter. Oh. Google Translate works so well, yeah. So oh. hard to read. It ended up, it, it worked out that I was a, just a quick sum in my head. It worked out that I would have been earning about maybe $12 an hour and in terms of my actual work that it took to put it together. Wow. And that is just nowhere near enough to make it worth doing That's that kind of thing again. That's a huge cut and pay from what you normally get. It, it is yeah. a massive cut and pay. Um, and oh, like yeah. I say, you, no, you get paid right. for your you get paid by the finished hour. That's that's just me working out roughly how and long that had to be it. agonizing. Oh my god, that wasn't even entertaining. Uh, it, it was genuinely painful. And the thing was, because it was taking so long, because I was having to reread so many not actually sentences. <laughs> I ended up working till the, 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 the on the deadline. I was working till six in the morning to to get it done and uploaded. And and no, sorry, I was working till five in the morning and then leaving at six to go on vacation. Damn! So oh God! I got no oh. sleep at all. Oops! <sighs> I've broken the lights. Lights went out. Uh oh, <laughs> he forgot to you know hook up his generator. Brown kid, brown kid. <sighs> I nearly went with the timer atmospheric in there, so that way you 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 can go. Oh, I spent too long in here. I gotta go. <laughs> yeah, that's not my wife flicking the lights on and off to make me go to bed. Remember those little bathroom timers they had? Little little bathroom timers. You put it on for like you know a minute, and then it would go out. You had to go back to it and turn it again. I can see that. <laughs> I spent too long here. The lights are. I gotta go. Yeah. No. Oh, yeah, but, yeah, those in the uh, corridors uh, of the building I lived in. So, uh, we uh, wanted to mention thing, a couple but, of projects that he's working on. I, absolutely, I, w I wanted to cover. Well, I want to ask one thing before we do that because you know I know it's getting late and he's probably going to go to bed very soon. From a producer standpoint, coming at it that way, what advice would you give authors coming into this that will help them to gain a producer to make the process easier or to entice people who do your side of it? Um, well, it doesn't hurt to have a decent budget. I will say that you don't necessarily need one. But it doesn't hurt. You will get the more experienced people, yes. the more they will search for the higher paying work first. I know I do. Um, in terms of what you actually put on as your audition piece, like I say, pick something that's representative, pick something that's going to attract the kind of 
somebody who likes the kind of book you've actually written, someone that represents the work that you've done, gives them a good idea of how you write, what kind of characters are involved, what kind of work it is. Um, the the blurb that you give your, you know, the the dust jacket entry that you put on there, make sure that does actually ask a few, like you say, ask a few of your beta readers, make sure that does actually represent your work. Um, yeah. But above all, get someone to read it out loud to you. Make sure that it is actually possible to read it all the way through the, the audition piece, all the way through out loud, not knowing what you're about to read and not run out of breath or lose track of the sentence or forget how the sentence started. Uh, a, a, a big problem is, is run on sentences. I mean, just in life. I mean, I've, I've been spitting yep. them out all night. Um, a yeah, big problem is run sense. on sentences. It's more of a problem when, in, when you're trying to read something blind. Um, if you've got, you know, anything, if you're getting close to three lines, sort of three full phrases in one sentence, maybe think about breaking it up. Um, it might be important for you. It might be important that it is one sentence, but if it's not absolutely right. necessary, break it up, break it down, make it into, just make it easier to read. Because a lot of people, not everybody, but a lot of people, when they're reading on the page, they'll be reading it out loud to themselves in their head. And if you've, right. if by the time you get to the end of the sentence, you've forgotten how it started, that's a hard book to read. And you're probably going to put it down and you're not going to buy the person's next book. So just in terms of retention, that's important in terms of retaining your readers. It's equally important when you're trying to find someone to read your work uh, as a producer, because uh, especially a more experienced producer is going to know that the harder it is to read, the lower your pay is. Like I say, the longer right. it takes to actually produce an hour of audio, the less of a profit you're making on your time. So that is a factor. It's more important that it's representative of your work, but it's something to bear in mind that it has to be relatively easy to read the first time. You're going in blind. You're just reading it straight off. Get somebody who's not one of your beta readers to read that section to you out loud to see how they do. And that makes sense. No, it absolutely makes sense. Absolutely. And it's uh, it's and I, I appreciate your time. It's it's been great having you here, Reese. Now, for those of you who want to find out what Reese has done, please go to audible.com, search R H Y S David, and find his work. Amazingly enough, you will find you know he did an awesome job on the Shadow War Chronicles. He's also done things like Hannibal's Foe, you know, obviously Revenant, Jamestown, Vengeance, um, Lost Star. Uh, I think Principles to Fortune was one of them. Um, anything uh, off the top you could think of you want to make sure we mention? Uh, well, those are the main ones that are already out there. There is one that's just yep. going through quality assurance right now uh, called Beginner's Luck. Um, and I'm really, genuinely, really impressed with this guy's writing. It's, it's a, a, awesome. a wonderful world he's constructed. It's really well written, lovely prose, really well-rounded characters. And it's, 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 there's a lot of post-apocalyptic sci-fi fantasy around at the moment. Of those books, it's actually quite an original take on the idea. So yeah, if you're a fan of, in okay. any way, a fan of, of speculative fiction, you'll like this guy's world that he's created. It's, it's quite original and it's really well written. When is it releasing? Um, it's difficult, as you know, it's difficult to say how long quality assurance is going to yeah, take. Yeah, well, it should be in the next week couple period, of weeks, yeah. two, maybe three weeks. I would think they've had it for about a week so far. Well, I'll definitely grab it, and anybody else out there sees it, grab Beginner's Luck. And those of you who didn't know that I haven't shot at the top of the world, Vengeance will be out roughly the first or second week in September as well. So he, Reese has some very good books coming out. I will have make sure to put all those up on the site as well. That's Thank correct. you very much. Well, thank you, Reese. I, I appreciate you coming by. Not uh, at all. Thanks for having go me. Go to bed, man. Oh, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll see you in a couple once my next one comes out. <laughs> so I think I'm going to be very, very English and go and have a cup of tea, and then I'll go to bed. Hey, go. I'm going to go get some coffee because Make I'll be very American. Sure. When I say I'm going to have a cup of tea, I'll just tuck this behind my ear for when I have my cup of tea. Oh, there you go. That's good. You got a little pinky thing you got to go on there. Don't forget that. Yeah. I'm going to go cue and have tea. Nobody does the pinky thing. 
<laughs> oh, I do, but I do it with pints of beer. I just do it to annoy people. <laughs> oh, wait, always, beer always is- remember the pinky. That's right. You can be very insulting with, with your pinky. Got- that's not T. That's Guinness. I know better. 